Well, today is a great day for America. Is it? In our long battle with coronavirus, I think it's a great milestone, a <laughs> great day. I'll take your word for it, Mr. President. Well, I don't know why I came here tonight. Maybe. I got the feeling that something ain't right. Today it is. I'm so scared in case I fall off my chair. Says the president. And I'm wondering how I'll get down the stairs. Don't trust him. Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. Here I am, stuck in the middle with you. Here I am. From Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles, this is the broadcast as heard on KPFK, 90.7 FM in LA, 98.7 in Santa Barbara, 93.7 in San Diego, and 99.5 FM in Ridgecrest and China Lake. Also in California in Red Bluff and Redding on KFOI, Round Mountains KKRN, and Eureka's KGOE. Up in Oregon on the Central Coast on KYAQ, Cottage Grove's KSO, Eugene's KEPW. Lancaster, Pennsylvania's WLRI, Maui, Hawaii's KAKU. In Columbus, Ohio on WGRN, Palinville, New York's WLPP, Rochester, New York's WRFZ. Down in New Orleans on WHIV, out in Gallup, New Mexico on KNIZ. Concord, New Hampshire's WNHN, Fayetteville, Arkansas's KPSQ, in Seattle on KODX, Janesville, Wisconsin's WADR, and Minneapolis, St. Paul's AM 950, KTNF, amongst other fine terrestrial affiliates. Also, we're found on the Internet, coast to coast and around the globe on the Progressive Voices Channel, Netroots Radio, Radio for Humans, FYI Nation, NicoleSandler.com, Radio Free Brooklyn, Workforce Rising, No Lies Radio, Verdant Square Radio, and Detour Talk. Blanketing planet Earth five days a week. I'm Brad Friedman, your friendly investigative blogger, journalist, troublemaker, muckraker, and all-around swell fellow, says me, I think, from bradblog.com. Thank you very much for joining us today for whatever happens on today's <laughs> broadcast. Uh, first, I have to say, uh, my computer crashed earlier today. Interesting that we were just covering that uh, Colonial Pipeline hack and the oh, ransomware yes. <laughs> attack, and all of a sudden my computer... It just went... Anyway, I've spent all day trying to get it back up and running in time to do today's show. I did not have to pay anyone ransomware, so... Uh, but I, I gotta say, it, it's been a struggle to get here on yeah. time today. So if, if it is the worst most disorganized mess of a broadcast you have ever heard, that would be why. Of course, if it is the best broadcast you have ever heard, <laughs> perhaps I should rethink my show prep routine. <laughs> Secondly, Desi Doyen, hello. Hey. This weekend, you and I both will be two weeks beyond our second COVID vaccine shots. We are vaxxed. So in theory, we will be just about as inoculated and immune as possible. So I don't know about you, Des, but I plan to spend most of the weekend running around town and licking doorknobs wherever <laughs> I can find them. That's my big plan for the weekend. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Uh, sounds exciting. In, in, in tr you'll be joining me. Yeah, yeah, you love it. In truth, it sounds like the uh, CDC, however, has uh, some very good and well-timed news. I guess particularly for you and I. And yes, about 117 million or so Americans just like us today. In a sharp turnabout. Federal health officials on Thursday advised that Americans who are fully vaccinated against the coronavirus may stop wearing masks or maintaining social distance in most indoor and outdoor settings, regardless of the size of the crowds. In a major step toward returning to pre-pandemic life, According to AP, the CDC eased mask wearing guidance for fully vaccinated people on Thursday, allowing them to stop wearing masks outdoors in crowds and in most indoor settings. President Joe Biden, uh, during remarks at the Rose Garden, heralded the new guidance, saying today is a great day for America. Well, today is a great day for America. In our long battle with the coronavirus. Just a few hours ago, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the CDC 
announced that they are no longer recommending that fully vaccinated people need wear masks. This recommendation holds true whether you are inside or outside. I think it's a great milestone, a great day. <laughs> well, yes, uh, it is, but there's a few buts I'll yeah. get to in a moment. The, the guidance still calls for wearing masks in crowded indoor settings like buses, planes, hospitals, prisons. Prisons, Des, keep that in mind, <laughs> just saying. And uh, homeless shelters, but it will help clear the way for reopening workplaces, schools, other venues, even removing the need for social distancing for those who are fully vaccinated. Dr. Rochelle Walensky, the director of the CDC, said at a White House briefing, quote, we have all longed for this moment when we can get back to some sense of normalcy. Permission to stop using masks now offers an incentive to the many millions who are still holding out on getting vaccinated. As of Wednesday, about 154 million people have received at least one dose of the COVID of, of a COVID-19 vaccine, but only about one third of the nation. That's about 118 million people have been fully vaccinated. You're not fully considered fully vaccinated until two weeks after either the one dose Johnson Johnson shot uh, or the second dose of the uh, Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. But the uh, pace for giving out these shots has slowed considerably. Providers are administering about a little bit over two million doses per day on average. That uh, seems like a lot, but it's a 36 percent drop uh, from mid-April when about 3.4 million were getting vaccinated each day. Nonetheless, the country's aggressive uh, vaccination campaign has paid off, it seems. U.S. virus cases are now at their lowest rate since September of last year. Deaths are at their lowest point since last April. April. That's good. And the test positivity rate is at the lowest point since the beginning of the pandemic. Dr. Walensky said the long awaited change is thanks to the millions of people who have gotten vaccinated and is based on the latest science about how well those shots are working. She said anyone who is fully vaccinated can participate in indoor and outdoor activities, large or small, without wearing a mask or physically distancing. If you're phys if you're fully vaccinated, that's if you're fully vaccinated, you can start doing the things that you had stopped doing because of the pandemic. How do you feel about that, Des? Well, I feel great. I'm glad that things are going so well across yeah. the country. I wish they were going faster and more people were getting vaccinated, especially in the southeast where they have a huge dearth of people getting vaccinated. The new guidance is likely to open the door, however, to confusion because there is no surefire way for businesses or others to distinguish between those who are fully vaccinated and those who are not. Walensky said those who are not fully vaccinated should continue to wear masks indoors. Yeah. See, that's where that's where my that's where I stop. Yeah, <laughs> because there's no way to tell. Like you say, there's no way mm -hmm. to tell who is vaccinated and who is not. The majority of the population is not yet fully vaccinated. So my sense is still wear a mask indoors because mm. you don't know who those people are or if they're actually, truly, honestly vaccinated. Yeah, I, as I've been thinking about this over the past hour or two since this news came out, I, I, I'm not sure. It may take me a while yeah, me before too. I get comfortable yeah. uh, not wearing masks around anybody, actually, indoors or out, to be frank. You know, unless it's somebody who I know, who I know well, who I know that they have definitely been vaccinated. And they're not and so lying forth. to you. Right. So, yeah. Walensky also encouraged people who have weak immune systems, such as from organ uh, transplants or cancer treatment, to talk with their doctors first before getting rid of their masks. That's because of continued uncertainty about whether the vaccines can rev up a weakened immune system as well as they do for normal, healthy ones. Walensky warned that unexpected twists in the pandemic could still require the CDC to once again amend guidance. Fully vaccinated people who develop symptoms, she notes, should still use masks and get tested. 
asked how the new guidance might apply to businesses and schools, she said that the agency was working to issue new recommendations soon for specific settings, including summer camps and travel. That would be uh, published soon. In the meantime, uh, even vaccinated individuals must cover their faces and physically distance when they go to doctors, hospitals, or long-term care facilities like nursing homes. Also, when traveling by bus, plane, train, or other modes of public transportation, or while in transportation hubs like airports and bus stations, uh, as well as prisons, jails, and homeless shelters. Uh, in deference to local authorities, the CDC said vaccinated Americans must continue to abide by existing state, local, or tribal laws and regulations, whatever they are, and follow local rules for businesses and uh, workplaces. The more people uh, that continue to get vaccinated, the faster infections will drop and the harder it'll be for the virus to mutate enough to escape vaccines. Bingo. She stressed, urging everyone 12 and older who is not yet vaccinated to sign up. Uh, the new guidance, meanwhile, had an immediate effect at the White House. They've taken a cautious approach to easing virus restrictions, but staffers were informed that masks are now no longer required for people who have been fully vaccinated. And Biden, who was meeting with vaccinated Republican lawmakers in the Oval Office on Thursday when the guidance was announced, led the group in removing their masks on Thursday afternoon. First Lady Jill Biden was traveling in West Virginia at the time. She uh, told reporters after the guidance, quote, we feel naked. <laughs> as she and her party removed their face coverings, then paused and said, well, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> now, of course, over at Fox News this week, uh, the Foxes on the couch and friends uh, finally announced that they, too, had been vaccinated, despite the fact that Republicans, Republican men in particular, are among the least likely to say that they plan to get vaccinated. But as usual... As the uh, Foxy friends were telling the audience that they had gotten their vaccine, uh, as they were giving the information about that, that came with a healthy dose, as usual, of misinformation. See if you can spot it here. I understand there are people that have vaccine hesitancy, mm -hmm. but we all three are vaccinated. And I will tell you, when I got it, it was just like, OK, a relief. now, exactly. Yeah. Now I know I'm not going to get it. I'm not right. going to die from it if I do get it. There's a small percentage of ch a chance that you could get it. Right. But it, it's the people who have not gotten the shot, which, you know, ultimately, they're the ones who are in peril. And they're that's the right. ones that, Wrong. you know, making their own decisions. That's right. I, absolutely. But nonetheless, I think that's probably why the CDC is still doing that. You know, when you were talking to Dr. But we, we, uh, that's ridiculous. You can't revise your policy. Here are the vaccines. We have all these states giving most of it back because yeah. they've, they've almost reached capacity. Don't if you make a decision, I have total respect for that, because with that decision comes the distancing you want to keep. If you have underlying conditions, that's right. the risk you're going to take. So you go do it. So we have an option. We took it. We're the lucky country that came up with these vaccines. Yep. We're very fortunate to have access anywhere you go mm -hmm. in this country. You can now get them. If you don't choose it, that's OK. Just amend your life that way. Let us get back to normal. Right. And maybe you have the underlying conditions of the antibodies. That's, and people can make their own choices. Absolutely. Don't go to, I'm not telling vaccine, anyone to get to it or not I, get I it. I agree. Right, I agree. but they've yeah. got to, you know, they got to yeah. run by the rules and social distance That's and right. all that don't, stuff. Don't don't they, let us do it. They don't listen. The, the worry is that they would infect somebody else who also, like them, is not vaccinated. So that was, of course, before uh, today's announcement from the CDC that right. uh, vaccinated people can stop social distancing, can stop wearing masks, and so forth. But uh, a couple of things, maybe a dozen or so, <laughs> that they uh, got wrong there. Well, one, we have the states have not. Re Reached capacity. Uh, there's uh, two thirds of the nation still to be uh, vaccinated. Um, but here's the thing. It, when they say, oh, it, you know, it's up to people if they don't want to get vaccinated, they're only imperiling themselves. That is not true because people who do not get vaccinated are imperiling everyone, including those people who have gotten vaccinated. Yes, you can still get it. It will it, 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 even if you're vaccinated, although you're less likely to get it, it's less likely to be severe, uh, much less likely to hospitalize you or kill you. But you can still get it. But even putting that aside, 
you know, when they say, well, it's up to you. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. If you choose to, it's okay. You're only hurting yourself. That is not true because the more people who don't get vaccinated, the more the virus uh, can uh, go from person to person and change and mutate and create variants that may not be uh, that that are the those of us who have been vaccinated are not able to protect against those new variants. That's why there's such a rush to get so many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. And the other part of that is, OK, let's say you're vaccinated. No vaccine is 100 percent uh, effective. So maybe you get sick. I don't know about you. I don't like getting sick. So I'm not going to be around people who might get me sick, even if I won't be hospitalized. I still don't like. Well, getting you sick. won't know. And that's true. And eventually, if you are somebody who does get the uh, the, the COVID infection mm-hmm. from somebody who's unvaccinated, even if you are vaccinated, you can still spread it to people who cannot genuinely get a vaccine, who are medically fragile, Correct. for example. And you can spread it to somebody who can spread it to somebody who can spread it to somebody, eventually killing someone that you don't even know because you were not taking precautions. Well, yeah, that's absolutely right. My concern, however, is that uh, and, and yes, to underscore, there are some people who have a, a very good reason to not get a vaccine. They, you know, they have a, Cancer a problem immune system, uh, allergies and so forth. Uh, but for the rest of us, you know, when they say, oh, it only imperils you, that is not true. Uh, you know, we can, we're, we're seeing more and more variants that are more and more transmissible, more and more dangerous. And, uh, you know, if, if that happens and we get these variants that the virus, the vaccine does not prevent, we may have to start all of this over from scratch with masks and social distancing and lockdowns, etc., as we all line up for a new vaccine shot to protect against the variants. So get your damn shots. That's just me. Pretty please. Now, some states have come up with some clever ways to encourage people to get vaccinated. New Jersey, uh, I I guess, is giving out a free beer, I think. Kind of lame, but okay. well, get a free beer. Sure. If that helps. It's like, oh, you want me to get a life saving vaccine? Well, what's in it for me? Uh, Anyway, last month, West Virginia's Governor Jim Justice, Republican, used to be a Democrat, became a Republican just after he got elected the day after. Yes. uh, He announced that the state uh, will offer young people a hundred dollars savings bond to get vaccinated against COVID-19. That's what he announced last week. Actually, I kind of like that idea. I think that's a good one. Justice said he plans to use a small part of the state's anticipated two billion dollars in federal pandemic funding for for testing, protective equipment and economic relief. To help pay for these savings bonds for uh, young people to get shots to protect against COVID as uh, vaccine vaccine hesitancy apparently looms large in West Virginia for some reason. Justice said uh, during an interview last month it would be such a drop in the bucket compared to the ungodly amount of money we are spending right now. And he's right about that. Recent polling has shown that self-identified conservative men who many of whom support Donald Trump are among the least likely Americans to get the shot. And there are a lot of those men in states like West Virginia. But Ohio's Republican governor, Mike DeWine, has come up with a, quite a whopper of an incentive. On Wednesday, he announced a, a huge incentive, I guess, for adults in, in the state to get vaccinated. A lottery, a lottery later this month where adults who have received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine can win one million (laughs) dollars. Two weeks from tonight, he tweeted uh, on Wednesday, uh, two weeks from tonight on May 26, we will announce a winner of a separate uh, of a separate drawing for adults who have received at least their first dose of the vaccine. This announcement will occur each Wednesday for five weeks, and the winner each Wednesday will receive $1 million. The Ohio Department of Health will sponsor uh, the, the drawings. The Ohio Lottery will conduct them. The money will come from the federal coronavirus relief funds. Oh, it's a socialist lottery. Uh, to be eligible, you uh, you must be 18 years of age or older on the day of the drawing. Uh, you must be an Ohio resident and you must be vaccinated before 
the drawing. I'll I'll tell you. I'd I'd like to uh, hear from uh, some of our folks in uh, in Columbus, Ohio, WGRN ninety four point one up there. What they think about this, and if this might make them more inclined to get their shots. You can drop me an email. I am bradcast at bradblog.com. In any event, DeWine hit back against the notion that the lottery is a waste of money. Uh, he said, uh, he tweeted, I know some may say, DeWine, you're crazy. This million dollar drawing idea of yours is a waste of money. But truly, he says, the real waste at this point in the pandemic, uh, when the vaccine is readily available to anyone who wants it, is uh, a life lost to COVID-19. That's the real waste. And I do not agree, disagree with his general sentiment. That said, as I was hearing about this story, a million dollars each week, that's a very nice prize for one person. I guess five people, because they're going to do it five weeks in a row. But wouldn't it be equally nice to uh, increase the odds of people winning by uh, about a thousand percent, I think, by, you know, say, giving 10 prizes of $100,000 each each week instead of one person gets a million? <laughs> that made sense to me. I mean, is anybody really going to say, well, you know, I'd get a life saving vaccine uh, for a million dollars. But what am I going to do with one hundred thousand dollars? Don't waste my time. <laughs> Really? I mean, they could they could give it to 20. They could give $50,000 to 20 people each week. That sounds pretty good to me. That seems like that would be a good incentive. But, you know, this is how people think. And I, I have never understood this. It's the same thing like with the Powerball lottery. lottery yeah. You know, people rush out to buy tickets when it gets to be a $100 million prize or something. Meanwhile, it's like $20 million pretty much every week. And nobody cares about that. What am I? Twenty million dollars. Don't waste my time with that. What am I going to do with twenty million? Let me know when it's a hundred million. Then I'll be interested in standing in hours long lines. <laughs> Not to mention, by the way, when there's fewer people uh, playing, you there's less of a chance that you may have to split the jackpot with somebody. But you know, what do I know? I don't play this game. <laughs> So, yeah, get your shots and then go out and, you know, lick doorknobs like Desi and I will be doing all weekend. <laughs> In other ridiculous news today that kind of makes me embarrassed sometimes to be an American and wonder what the hell is wrong with this country. <sighs> Republican uh, <laughs> Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene confronted, aggressively confronted Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on Wednesday, falsely accusing her of supporting, quote, terrorists. She did this in the U.S. Congress, leading the New York Congresswoman's office to call on leadership to ensure that Congress remains, quote, a safe, civil place for all members and staff. Apparently, two Washington Post reporters Witness this as Ocasio-Cortez uh, exited the House chamber late on Wednesday ahead of Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, Greene shouted, uh, quote, hey, Alexandria, twice in an effort to get her attention. When AOC did not stop walking, Greene picked up the pace, began shouting at her and asking her why she supports Antifa. Yes, Antifa. Apparently, this lady was actually doing this in the halls of Congress. Oh, and also uh, Antifa and Black Lives Matter falsely labeling them, quote, terrorist groups. Green also shouted that Ocasio-Cortez was failing to defend her, quote, radical socialist beliefs by declining to publicly debate the freshman from Georgia, saying uh, she shouted, she shouted, you don't care about the American people. Why do you support terrorists and Antifa? AOC did not stop to answer Green. She only turned once and throw, threw her hands up in the air, exasperated. Uh, later, uh, AOC's spokesperson uh, said Representative Green tried to begin an argument with Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. And when Rep. Ocasio-Cortez tried to walk away, Congresswoman Green began screaming and called Rep. Ocasio-Cortez a terrorist sympathizer. She said, we hope leadership and the sergeant at arms will take real steps to make Congress safe, a safe civil place for all members and staff, especially as many officers 
especially as many offices are now discussing reopening. One member has already been forced to relocate her office due to Congresswoman Green's attacks. Uh, the sp uh, spokesperson for AOC said before walking away, Green said that the encounter was intended to hold Democrats accountable <laughs> for their policy proposals, because, you know, that's how you do it. That's how you hold them accountable. You yell at them across the halls of Congress and you call them terrorists. There's real accountability for you, at least if you're in fifth grade. Green told a small group of reporters after the incident that AOC was a, quote, chicken because she didn't want to debate the Green New Deal with her. Antifa BLM riots. And she's a chicken. She doesn't want to debate the Green New Deal. I was going to say, I don't think the debate has been agreed to yet. So, you know, this her behavior uh, against uh, Ocasio-Cortez on Wednesday, this is a member, she's an elected member of the U.S. House of Representatives running around calling another member a chicken because she won't debate her, because she won't, you know, give her high profile that AOC has and lend it exactly to this horrible woman to try to raise her profile. Exactly. In the, the debate me wine. The, oh, debate me. You're too scared to debate me. It's a wine <laughs> and it is intended to ride the coattails of people like AOC who who have quite a following. Mm -hmm. And it would definitely elevate Marjorie Taylor Greene's um, profile if she, if she could trick AOC into debating yeah. her which you know would be stupid and silly because Marjorie Taylor Greene has actually nothing that is fact-based to say now if you saw there was a video that surfaced not long ago uh, back in it, it was uh, was it yeah it was 2019 it was after the 2018 mass shooting at uh, a Parkland uh, in in, in uh, the high school in Parkland Florida she did the same thing, Marjorie Taylor Greene. She stalked and uh, David Hogg, who was the uh, young gun safety, became a gun safety a activist after his school was shot up. And I think this was before Greene was actually in Congress, but she followed him around in D.C. as Hogg was talking to uh, lawmakers to uh, try and enact, you know, gun safety laws. And Green was following him around, shooting cell phone video of him and again calling him a chicken because he wouldn't debate her about guns. This kid who survived a mass shooting at his high school. Green has also confronted other members of Congress in the same way. Earlier this year, Congresswoman Cori Bush from Missouri accused Green and her staff of accosting her in a tunnel beneath a House office building. After she had asked Green to wear a mask out of concern for the health of my staff, other members of Congress and their congressional staff, Green denied the allegation uh, and accused Bush of lying and leading a, quote, terrorist mob because Bush supports Black Lives Matter. So this is her act. The uh, incident prompted Bush to ask Democratic leadership if she could move her office away from Green at the time. And by the way, Green is a woman who, before she became a congresswoman, promoted commenters online who had called for shooting Nancy Pelosi in the head. Remember that one? In February, she also got into a confrontation with the office of a neighboring congresswoman over transgender rights after Congresswoman Marie Newman, Democrat from Illinois, hung a transgender pride flag outside of her office in honor of her transgender daughter, in order to push back against Green's opposition to legislation that would extend civil rights protections to the LGBT community, Green, <clears throat> in response, hung up a poster across the hall that read, There are two genders, male and female. Trust the science. So, uh, a real charmer. Yeah, she's just a, class. a delightful person. Now, uh, and even, by the way, Republicans have been criticizing her behavior. Congressman Adam Kinziger said, while I might not agree with AOC on issues, I've never seen her confront a colleague like this. The House was created to debate emotional issues professionally, and it just seems some want attention or cannot handle their emotions. And then Green mocked. Kinsinger, <laughs> of course, a, a Republican who is a veteran uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, calling him little Adam. 
and also, uh, you know, said, I asked AOC to debate me uh, to, to her on her destructive socialist policies. But Sandy, I guess Alexandria is now Sandy, doesn't know how to work with Republicans. Neither do you, she said to the Republican mocking him. She went on to call uh, Ocasio-Cortez and Elon Omar, Rashida Tlaib, all of them she accused of being terrorist sympathizers, calling them the Jihad Squad. Well, this is what happens when you elect a brain-poisoned Fox News watcher to Congress. Yeah. Meanwhile, you know, Republicans are doing nothing about this woman running around with this kind of behavior, attacking other, well, attacking Democrats and other Republicans alike. That's all just fine. They wouldn't even remove her from her, uh, her, her committee assignments. That had to be done by the Democrats who had to vote for it. But while they do nothing about Green, the very same Republicans, as we discussed yesterday, voted to remove one of the farthest right wing members of their caucus, Liz Cheney, from her leadership position because she refuses to lie about the fact that, yes, Trump lost the election and, yes, he should be held accountable for inciting the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. And just hours after after they did that, after the Republicans met and removed Cheney from her leadership position, during a hearing in in the U.S. House with Trump's former acting defense secretary regarding what happened that day on January 6th and why it took so long to get the National Guard in to protect the Capitol from thousands of angry MAGA mobsters, well, a number of House Republicans began downplaying the insurrection, one of them comparing it to just a normal day at the Capitol, suggesting that if, if you didn't know that it was January 6th, it would have just looked like some tourists coming in to look at the Capitol. Seriously, that's what he said, and I don't have time to play uh, some of these comments, and they were appalling, but uh, CNN did a great job. I'll try to link to it. Did a great job of, of, of sort of contrasting the comments from these Republican members of Congress during these House hearings, contrasting those statements to the video that we have all seen from the I think all of us have seen it. Maybe these members of Congress haven't, but we've all seen from January 6th this violent attack, these riots, including new video now from uh, one officer, Capitol Police officer Michael Fanone. His body cam video as he was dragged down the stairs of the Capitol by the mob and tased repeatedly by them with his own taser, barely escaping with his own life after appealing to you know some members of the mob, telling them that he, oh, he has children and a family. Yeah. If you're tourists, the police don't have to ask you not to hurt them because they have children. Oh, you mean regular tourists to the Capitol don't generally steal the taser off a Capitol police officer, drag him down the stairs and tase him repeatedly? So, you know, the question is, will there ever be any accountability for all of this madness, including for Donald Trump, who Liz Cheney at least tried to hold accountable by voting in favor of his impeachment, his second impeachment? She voted against his first one, but she voted in favor of his second one for inciting uh, the insurrection on January 6th. Will there ever be any accountability for all of this madness or is this just going to get worse and worse? Well, maybe, maybe there will be some accountability. And I'm underscoring maybe here because we've got some interesting news out of Florida today. You know, where the former disgraced president is hiding out. This news may offer a bit of encouragement in that regard. Again, underscoring maybe. We'll see. That's next on the broadcast. I'm Brad Friedman. What the public hears on the public airwaves matters. At the Bradcast, we do our best to bring you accurate news and analysis on the issues that actually matter, and we do it all independently without corporate or political influence. But we can't do it without you, now more than ever. Please help us stay on your public airwaves by going to bradblog.com donate to help keep us going. That's bradblog.com donate. And thanks. Uh -huh. 
Well, we'll see. We'll see. I'm not sure the law has one just yet. <laughs> Welcome back to the Bradcast. Brad Friedman from bradblog.com. I am rooting for the law. I am rooting for them in this case. Uh, there was so, And I'm not sure yet what to make of this, uh, Desi Doyen. They okay. scoop this morning from Politico, which I'll sort of just you know leave here for you to make whatever sense of you would like. This was leading their uh, so-called Politico playbook today, This their newsletter. It's read by a huge amount of people, uh, especially in D.C. It's also frequently uh, sponsored by fossil fuel companies, but that's not what we're here to talk about <laughs> right now. We'll have some of that coming up in a little bit with your Green News report. Yep. But uh, so here's, here's, what, here's their lead, their scoop. Law enforcement officials in Palm Beach County, Florida, have actively prepared for the possibility that Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance could indict former President Donald Trump while he's at Mar-a-Lago. That, according to two high-ranking county officials involved in planning sessions. So they've actually had planning sessions for what would happen if the Manhattan District Attorney from New York indicted Donald Trump. Among the topics discussed in those meetings, how to handle the thorny extradition issues that could arise if an indictment moves forward in New York. Now, apparently an obscure clause in Florida's statute on interstate extradition gives Governor Ron DeSantis, a uh, big, big Trumpy guy, uh, gives him the ability to intervene in such case and even investigate whether an indicted person ought to be surrendered to law enforcement officials from another state, which means that as Mar-a-Lago prepares to close down for the season and Trump prepares to relocate to Bedminster, New Jersey, it isn't just the uh, Florida heat that he's leaving behind, says Politico. He could lose a key piece of political protection. Hmm. when he's not in Florida. Apparently, Mar-a-Lago Mar uh, is closed over the summer. After Memorial Day, they shut down. Its members head out to Europe and other less hot and humid climes, I guess. And so less Trump, hurricane prone. Yes, that too. Uh, and, and, and so Trump is planning to do the same thing, at least as of now. He's planning to head up to Bedminster, New Jersey to his golf club up there for the summer, which is, by the way, only about an hour outside of New York City, where uh, Cy Vance plies his trade as the district attorney. The uh, clerk of the Circuit Court of Palm Beach County, he's the official who would be in charge of opening a potential fugitive at large case. That's what they're calling wow. Joe Joe Abruzzo. Uh, he told Politico about the Florida law, quote, the statute leaves room for interpretation that the governor has the power to order a review and potentially not comply with the extradition notice, said Abruzzo. So they've actually talked to him about this. If an indictment comes down while Trump is in Bedminster, however, for the summer up in New Jersey, Politico reports this could all play out very differently. New Jersey's extradition statute is similar to Florida's, apparently giving the governor the power to investigate an out-of-state warrant. But because the governor is uh, a Democrat, Phil Murphy, and no fan of Donald Trump, he would not likely intervene to stop Trump's extradition. In the event of an indictment, Trump's lawyers could also negotiate a condition of surrender, which could cut local law enforcement out. But with Trump settling in down in New Jersey for the next five months, says Politico, Florida is unlikely to have uh, to have to sort through any of this anytime soon. As Manhattan D.A. Vance uh, is, is currently investigating whether Trump and his businesses committed banking and tax fraud, among other lines of inquiry, as he said, ha has said, by the way, Vance has that he plans to retire at the end of the year. So any indictment, Politico speculates, uh, might happen well before the end of the year. And maybe that's just one of the reasons why we have not seen an indictment yet against Donald Trump, because Vance realizes, well, if he's going to be down in Florida, 
that may, may make it more difficult to get at them versus Bedminster, New Jersey. Well, I'm glad that the Palm Beach County officials that Politico spoke to have yeah. said that they are thinking this through about what yeah. they might do in any number of scenarios. Uh-huh. And I also think it'll be very interesting to keep an eye on Donald Trump's movements and whether or not he actually decides this year for some reason to not go somewhere else you other know, than Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, maybe I'll stay here in Mar-a-Lago for a while. He Also, keep by the way, he that. would be heading back back in theory to Mar-a-Lago uh, once the fall comes. So, so there would be that deadline. So there's that, that well. deadline as well. Mm. If you want to indict Donald Trump, the best time to get him might be while he's an hour outside of New Jersey. Anytime essentially between, I guess, Memorial Day and Labor Day, pretty much. But I do find it interesting that this is being reported at all right now by Politico for whatever reason. They are suddenly doing it feels like kind of out of nowhere. I don't know. uh, You know, they don't appear to have any particular news about any impending indictment. Nonetheless, it's one of those stories that makes you go, hmm. Uh, I, I also find it amusing that Politico notes, by the way, an attorney for Donald Trump declined to comment. Well, now they're alerted to that. So <laughs> thanks, Politico. Oh, now they told now they told him what to do. Exactly. Yeah. See if he decides to stay there. That All might right. be why Politico is talking about it. Well, now. in other Trump are trying to help him out. Is that what you're saying? I don't are know. Are they colluding? Are you saying Politico is colluding <laughs> with Donald Trump? In other Trump accountability news today, however, uh, former Trump White House counsel Don McGahn, remember him? He is now expected to answer questions, quote, as soon as possible in a session with House lawmakers. However, it will be a closed session about former special counsel Robert Mueller's uh, investigation into uh, Donald Trump and Russia and the 2016 election and the firing of the FBI director and all that stuff. That, according to an agreement outlined in court filings uh, late on Wednesday night, McGahn will appear before the House Judiciary Committee after House Democrats sued to enforce a 2019 subpoena for his testimony. That would be, let me check my papers here, that's... Oh, about two years ago. Mm -hmm. And it took this long for them to come to an agreement for his testimony about whether Donald Trump obstructed justice in Mueller's Russia investigation. You'll recall that McGahn was a key witness in the uh, in the Mueller report. He helped to detail more than 10 instances in which Donald Trump appeared to obstruct justice, to obstruct the investigation itself. You know, into things like his firing of the FBI director, James Comey, his instructions to McGahn to create a false paper trail about some of this, including about firing the special counsel, Robert Mueller, stuff that is, you know, all of it unlawful and criminal and indictable. Unless you happen to be the sitting president of the United States, apparently, which, by the way, Donald Trump no longer is. So, yes, he could still be held accountable for these things by federal law enforcement officials. The agreement between the uh, DOJ and the House to allow this uh, testimony from McGahn uh, is intended to end this long running litigation over McGahn's testimony that the Trump administration had blocked initially. It's unclear what new information lawmakers will obtain from the interview with McGahn. Uh, that will be conducted more than two years after the subpoena was issued. And now that Trump has left office and Trump himself could also try to uh, somehow intervene and attempt to disrupt the McGahn deal. But good luck on that, Donnie. A transcript of the interview will be, quote, promptly provided to all involved parties for review before it will then be released publicly, according to this court filing. Uh, This followed the negotiations uh, that will allow McGahn to testify, again, in private instead of public, even though it will all be transcribed and that transcript will theoretically be made public. The scope of the session will be limited to the public portions of the Mueller report related to McGahn, And he can decline to answer questions that are deemed outside of those parameters. But if it's in regard to something that he said or uh, is characterized as saying in the in the public version, and we still haven't seen the entire uh, Mueller report, by the way. But 
if it's related to that, he must answer the questions in theory. We'll see how much he recalls. Well, and there has been, well, perhaps this will refresh your memory, Mr. <laughs> Mr. McGann, because there's a whole lot of stuff within the parameters that are spelled out in this agreement that could result in a whole lot of legal, yes, criminal trouble for the former president of the United States on a federal level. Lawmakers have said they considered McGahn, quote, the most important witness in the investigation of whether Trump obstructed justice by trying to shut down the Mueller inquiry, a claim that Trump has denied. Mueller's 448 page report mentions McGahn's statements more than 160 times. So, yeah, there will be a lot to talk about with Don McGahn. And uh, though Mueller said he could not and I. I believe he's wrong about this, but Mueller said that uh, DOJ's policies bar him from uh, indicting a sitting U.S. president. He did note that nothing uh, prevents the indictment of a former U.S. president. Trump was not a, a party, apparently, to this agreement between the DOJ and the House and, and Don McGahn. And once again, a Trump spokesman did not return messages seeking comment on the deal. You know the best job in the world right now? Being a Trump spokesperson, because you make a whole lot of money for saying absolutely nothing to journalists, it seems. Uh, anyway, put that on your radar as well for the days and weeks ahead. Whenever this interview is finally scheduled, it is likely to be newsworthy, I would say, to say the least. For what it's worth, I, I don't believe that, that there are any laws that prevent someone from being extradited from any state when it comes to an indictment under federal criminal charges. We may get to find out. We may. And I hope it happens soon. And I hope it happens before the summer is out, because that will make this a very lively summer. All right, quick break, and we are back with a very lively Green News report with an update. Did you see the update? I did. did. Okay, we'll have that update as well. Uh, Desi Doyne and the Green News report is next. I'm Brad Friedman. You are listening to the Bradcast. <laughs> The Bradcast and the Green News Report are 100% independent, 100% listener supported. But we can't do it alone. We need you. Please help us bring real facts to listeners at independent stations around the nation. Please drop by bradblog.com slash donate. That's bradblog.com slash donate. And thanks. Okay. Yeah, it's not. See, I'm. I'm. My notes are a mess. The <laughs> computer crashed. It's all fine. Everything's okay. I'm just a little confused today. Uh, I hope it's been a delightful show. Anyway, what will make it delighter? Delighteder. Delighter. <laughs> there we go. Our latest green news report. The fuel still has to travel through the supply chain before once again reaching the gas pumps. Colonial Pipeline restarts operation days after major cyber attack. Drivers along the East Coast have turned fears of a fuel crisis into an actual one. Out of gas because panic buying led to shortages. Biden administration greenlights nation's first major offshore wind farm. Plus, Elon Musk sent the cryptocurrency on a roller coaster ride over the past few days. Tesla ditches Bitcoin due to massive carbon footprint. All of those crypto stories and more straight ahead from Bradblog.com. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyen. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. Chaos at the pumps tonight. This is worse than a hurricane. No, no, it is not worse than a hurricane. What is wrong with this country? This is your Green News Report. Okay, Desi Doyen, 
Let's start hoarding gasoline <laughs> just because we can. No, I guess. no, let's what? not. No? Huge sighs of relief among officials and consumers after the corporate owner of the massive Colonial Pipeline began to resume operations on Wednesday, ending a five-day shutdown following a massive ransomware cyber attack. As we go to air, there is no word yet on whether the company paid the ransom. Oh, they paid. The pipeline supplies 45 percent of fuel for the East Coast. The the company says it will take several days until fuel deliveries return to normal. Correction, this just in. The company is saying they didn't pay. It's important to note that there was no actual gasoline shortage on the East Coast. But they paid. That's according to government officials and energy analysts. But panic buying and hoarding of gasoline by consumers caused a shortage. Reportedly, thousands of gas stations in the Southeast ran out of fuel by Wednesday. Reports of panicked consumers using unsafe methods to hoard gas forced the U.S. Product Safety Commission to issue a statement warning, quote, Do Do not fill plastic bags with gasoline. Plastic bags? They were putting gasoline in plastic bags? Reportedly. What is wrong with this country? Gas Buddies Patrick DeHaan on CNN warned that hoarding is dangerous and actually impacts public safety. People run out and hoard. That's going to mean less fuel for people that very much need it. Thinking first uh, first responders, frontline workers who need to get to work. Uh, Because once it's out, it's out. But the pipeline cyber attack and the ensuing panic paid off great for oil producers. (laughs) Oil and gas prices shot up because of the Colonial Pipeline ransomware hack. Huh. The more they fail, the more money they make. Go figure. In other news, out in the Pacific Ocean, Tropical Storm Andres set a new record for the earliest date in the year for a storm to form. Wait, this is May. Yes. We're having a hurricane form now? In the Pacific. It's showing up before the official start of the Pacific cyclone season, which begins on May 15th. Ah. Andres broke the previous earliest storm record that was set in 2017. Mm. Tesla CEO Elon Musk roiled markets for Bitcoin this week when he announced on Twitter that Tesla will stop accepting Bitcoin as payment for its electric cars, citing the vast and relentlessly increasing use of fossil fuels, especially coal, to provide energy for Bitcoin mining and transactions. About time. I know that a lot of people have been criticizing him for that for quite a while. Glad he is not doing that anymore. Bitcoin relies on computers to exist, and the growing value of Bitcoin is directly tied to the amount of energy it uses. Because of Bitcoin miners, several coal plants around the U.S. and the world that would have otherwise closed were pressed back into service to mine Bitcoin. Mm. Some more good news. The Biden administration has approved a new utility-scale solar energy project on public lands in the California desert. It will be located in an area designated under the Obama-era Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan, which minimizes impacts on plant and animal species and tribal and recreational stakeholders. Nice. And the Biden administration has given the final go-ahead for the nation's first major offshore wind farm, issuing final permits for the vineyard wind project off the coast of Massachusetts after it was canceled by the Trump administration. (laughs) The 800 megawatt wind farm will power 400,000 homes. However, Vineyard Wind's CEO says that since the U.S. currently lacks a wind energy supply chain, manufacturing of some of the project's components must be outside of the U.S. But he hopes that the approval will spur investment in more U.S. manufacturing. There's an idea. It's a first step in catching up to Europe, the global leader in offshore wind. Europe installed the equivalent of three vineyard wind projects in 2020 alone. Because Europe is better than us. What is wrong with this country? (laughs) For much more on all of these stories and the ones we couldn't get to today, check out our website at greennews.bradblog.com. Find, follow, and share us planet-wide on the Facebooks and the Twitters at Green News Report. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyen. And this has been your Green News Report. Yes, some mighty winds are blowing across the land and across the sea. It's blowing peace and freedom. It's blowing equality. Yes, it's blowing peace and freedom. It's blowing you and me. <laughs> are, are, are we allowed to play that on FCC radio? I hope so, because we just did. We just did. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Desi Doyen. Okay, so the update that I promised uh, to one of our stories, in mm-hmm. fact, includes the Colonial Pipeline, which has uh, reopened, and it's going to take a while for all the gas to get all the way up 5,000 miles uh, along the eastern seaboard, so I'm sure there will be more and more hoarding and, and so forth. By the way, you know that, that uh, gas apparently travels five miles an hour. Yeah, it's really slow. Through the pipeline. Yeah. So About a, a little bit faster than you can probably walk. Um, so you could walk yeah. all of that gas there. So I could walk that gas. <laughs> so get me some plastic bags, and I'll fill them up, and I'll walk some up from uh, no, no, Texas no, no, no. up to Linden, New Jersey. <laughs> so uh, the update, you heard me saying there, oh, they paid. They paid Colonial Pipeline. They, oh, they, you know, because the company was saying, oh, they weren't saying anything. They were indicating right. they hadn't paid. And their silence was telling. Guess what? They paid. So since we uh, laid down the Green News report earlier, uh, we have this in uh, from NBC News late today. Colonial Pipeline paid the hackers who shut down some of its networks nearly $5 million in ransom. But you could have a lot of COVID lotteries with that money. (laughs) Anyway, $5 million in ransom. That, according to a U.S. official familiar with the matter on Thursday. News of the payment was first reported by Bloomberg. U.S. official did not say how or when the company paid. So it could maybe it maybe it's not true. We have it from Bloomberg. We have it from NBC. NBC News, a a third party consulting company that now handles Colonial's press inquiries, declined to comment on the payment. Although if they didn't pay, you would think they would say they didn't pay. No, we we didn't pay. They're not saying anything instead. So, yeah, they paid. I I nailed it. I called it. (laughs) I got it right. And, you know, when we talked to Kim Zetter, cybersecurity journalist earlier this week, she explained why this is often frequently done. That's why these ransomware attacks are so successful, because, you know, a company like Colonial Pipeline, five million dollars is nothing to them. If that gets them back up and running. You know, it's a bargain. So, yeah, they did it. Uh, But I, you know, I kind of knew they were going to do it, not because of what Zetter said, but because I didn't trust this company, Colonial. They were the same ones who there was a oil leak in North Carolina. oil spill in North Carolina. Yeah, Yeah, that was uh, turned out to be 1.2 million gallons. And they only estimated it would be 63,000 when they first admitted that it happened. Right. Last year, 63,000. Now this year when nobody's looking, oh, it's over 1 million. And by the way, I called that one too. You were right. These guys always lie about how much is involved in their spills until uh, until much later when the public is no longer paying attention. Correct. But we will always be paying attention here on the broadcast and on the Green News Report. Thank you very much, Desi Doyen, yep. our producer and uh, our superstar on the GNR. Also, thanks to all of you for spending a portion of your day or night with us. It's always greatly appreciated. If you missed any portion of today's show or any other, you can download it anytime for free at bradblog.com. All of which is made possible by those of you who help us out by stopping by bradblog.com slash donate to help us stay on your public airwaves. Hey, now is a great time to sign up for a a monthly uh, contribution of any amount you like at bradblog.com slash donate. You can drop me email if you like. I'm bradcast at bradblog.com. And on the Facebooks and the Twitters, I am simply the Brad Blog. That is it. We will see you there. Until we see you here next time, I'm Brad Friedman. Good luck, world.